The stakes during the 1858 Illinois Senate debate were high. This was a time before the 17th Amendment, so rather than being elected directly by the populace of the state, the incumbent Democrat Stephen Douglas and his Republican challenger Abraham Lincoln would need to appeal directly to state legislators. To accomplish this, they organized a tour of debates throughout Illinois. Now known as the Great Debates or Lincoln-Douglas Debates, they were attended by large and active crowds who could at times be heard responding openly to the candidates as the debates rolled on. Though the incumbent Douglas and Mr. Lincoln covered several topics, none was covered more extensively than that of slavery in the Union. Fast forward to 1861, and Abraham Lincoln was on the cusp of his first inaugural address. Without a place to set his iconic stovepipe hat before delivering the speech, it was his rival Douglas who voluntarily held it for him. Sat only a few steps back, this symbolic gesture of union between Democrats and Republicans was perhaps one of the last to be seen before the bloody American Civil War took the lives of nearly a million young Americans. During their debates in 1858, the dissolving of the Union didn't seem far-fetched. The question of slavery was an old one, a problem that had pervaded the national dialogue since the birth of the nation. Article 1, Section 9 of the U.S. Constitution prohibited Congress from banning slave importation until the year 1808. The idea was to give the new nation 20 years to solve the slave issue because, despite the high ideals of the American founding, had the new Constitution disallowed slavery, it would have never been adopted. The three-fifths compromise determined that during census counts, slaves would be considered three-fifths of a person rather than being ignored totally. Ironically, this gave southern slaveholding states more representation in Congress, as the number of members in the House of Representatives is determined by the population. And so began the Great Split. American politics from the birth of the Constitution until the Civil War in 1860 reflected this division of North and South slave and free. It was a constant and contentious struggle right up until the start of the war to strike enough of a balance to keep the nation together. Politicians tried for nearly a century to create a patchwork of laws that could avoid a confrontation. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 prohibited slavery in new western territories north of the 36th-30th parallel. Except for in Missouri, of course, hence the name of the Compromise. Some founders knew that proposals like this were just a stopgap. Thomas Jefferson even mentioned in personal letters that a temporary fix, such as the Missouri Compromise, would lead only to the eventual dissolution of the Union. By 1840, from various efforts at the state level, nearly all slaves in northern states were free. To contrast this, the booming cotton industry ensured the slave population in southern states continued to explode. Both the North and the South were eager to expand and bring new free and slave states into the Union, respectively. More slave states would mean more representation for slavery in Washington, and vice versa. Every new territory admitted to the nation was a potential landmine for conflict. After taking a considerable amount of territory from Mexico, the spoils needed to be divided into slave and free areas. The Compromise of 1850 made the territory of the new slave state Texas a bit smaller, admitted California as a free state, and let the new territories of Utah and New Mexico decide for themselves whether they wanted to be slave or free. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, proposed again by Stephen Douglas, the hat-holding guy, remember? Admitted the new states of Kansas and Nebraska and allowed their voting population, aka white males with land, to decide if they should be slaveholding or free states. The nation was at a breaking point. Rather than admitting slave states and free states, Northern Democrats were desperately trying to hold the Union together by using the popular sovereignty principle to allow new states to vote on slavery. These kinds of compromises weren't enough for Southern Democrats who rightfully saw the institution of slavery under attack. The last log on the fire, or maybe better said, the last splash of gas on the flames, was the majority opinion from the 7-2 Dred Scott decision of the U.S. Supreme Court. This denied former slave Dred Scott his freedom, contending in the majority opinion that neither Scott nor any person of African descent had any right to petition the federal government for their freedom, as they were, in the eyes of the government, not citizens of the United States. These were the ripe issues discussed at great length during the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Stephen Douglas was known as the quote, little giant, short in stature, 
but strongly present. He believed in the principle of popular sovereignty, that voters should decide whether or not a state should have slavery, perhaps as a last-ditch idea to keep the Union from breaking. During the debates, he accused Lincoln of being a full-on abolitionist, seeking equal rights for black people, a claim which Lincoln denied in a way which may surprise you. I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. That I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of making voters of jurors or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people, and I will say in addition to this, that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality, and inasmuch as they cannot so live, while they do remain together there must be position of superior and inferior, and I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. Political expediency? Perhaps. Lincoln was nonetheless opposed to the expansion of slavery and believed strongly that the Union could not continue to exist as half-slave and half-free. And though this series of debates in Illinois was only for U.S. Senate, it came to represent a microcosm of the American political narrative at the time. And two years later, after Lincoln's wholesome defeat by Douglas in that Senate race, both men would then ascend as nominees of their respective political parties in the election of 1860. Lincoln, representing a new but united Republican Party, opposed to the expansion of slavery, and Douglas, representing a fractured Democratic Party whose southern wing had nominated another man dedicated to keeping the institution alive. Their split would win Lincoln the presidency. Before even taking the oath of office, seven states had already seceded from the Union. At this point, you may be wondering, why review this? Why go through this narrative once more? In the past few weeks, it has become incredibly obvious that many people in the South are attempting to wash slavery from history, whether it be in Texas school curriculum or by clinging to one of the variations of the Confederate flag. This, at the same time, many states are choosing to take it down from their public spaces. Texas lawmakers want to, quote, give slavery relatively little prominence compared to state rights. People defending these textbook edits and this flag need to reevaluate. If it wasn't obvious enough from my narrative so far, the Confederacy represented slavery. And here I have for you some of the actual statements of secession from several of the first few states, themselves explaining, in plain English, their motivation was clearly slavery. It wasn't state rights, unless you're referring to the state's right to own slaves. Here it is, directly quoted. The state of Georgia, in the very first line, the people of Georgia, having dissolved their political connection with the government of the United States of America, present to their confederates and the world the causes which have led to the separation. For the last 10 years, we have had numerous and serious causes of complaint against our non-slaveholding confederate states, with reference to the subject of African slavery. Mississippi, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of commerce on earth. South Carolina, we affirm that these ends for which the government was instituted have been defeated, and the government itself has been made destructive of them by the action of the non-slaveholding states. Those states have assumed the right of deciding upon the prop propriety of our domestic institutions and have denied the rights of property established in 15 of the states and recognized by the Constitution. <clears throat> they have denounced as sinful the institution of slavery. And Texas, in all the non-slaveholding states, in violation of that good faith and comity which should exist between entirely distinct nations, the people have formed themselves into a great sectional party, now strong enough in numbers to control the affairs of each of those states, based upon an unnatural feeling of hostility to these southern states and their, benefit, and their beneficent and patriarchal system of African slavery, proclaiming, proclaiming the debasing doctrine of equality of all men, irrespective of race or color, a doctrine at war with nature, in opposition to the experience of mankind, and in violation of the plainest revelations of divine law. The institution of slavery was the central reason behind the secession of southern states and the creation of the Confederacy. So it was along this vein that the Confederacy was born, and its various flags were designed, and it was that exact southern resistance that inspired segregationists in the 50s and 60s to once again 
take up the flag as a sign of protest towards integration. As a southerner, I do understand our pride, but we don't have to be silly about it. A couple years ago, I visited my family cemetery in Nashville, Tennessee. I was made aware of several Confederate veterans that lay there. I don't put these men on pedestals, but neither do I vilify them. They are simply part of my past. I can learn from their mistakes without carrying their symbols, without teaching an incorrect version of history. So what do you think? Given that individuals have the right to fly the flag, should we back the movement to remove it and related symbology from public spaces? And how do we deal with Texas and the new textbook curriculum?